Salt of the Earth Farm Stories is proudly brought to you by Grig Media. From generations old family farms to innovative sustainable practices, each episode offers a glimpse into the resilience, passion and dedication of Australian farmers. Be inspired by the stories of those who sow the seeds of the future. Today, we are joined by Luke Crawford from Jamestown in South Australia's Mid-North, where he and his father are running a continuous cropping operation with a fresh approach. Luke talks honestly about his feelings on sheep farming to engineering to innovative cropping practices. We dive into the techniques like stripping just the heads from crops, focusing on stubble retention and improving soil health, all while growing solid crops in tough conditions. It's a conversation about resilience, adaptation, and the future of farming. Let's get into it. Good morning, Luke. Good morning. Mate, can you tell me exactly where are we and what are you farming here? Uh, well, we are five k's east of Jamestown, South Australia. We're continuous croppers, so we have wheat, barley, beans, and lentils. And how many acres or hectares? Uh, so cropping 750 hectares. And has this farm been in the family for a few generations? Uh, yes, I am the fourth generation. So we've been on this farm for just over 100 years. Yeah, we were north. Yeah, they moved here to get away from the train line. Yeah, so your great grandfather was a little bit further north running what sheep back then? Yeah, yeah, sheep and cropping. Yeah, probably uh, predominantly sheep though. Yeah, they bought this place. Yeah, it's eventuated since then. Have you ever been told of any of those early stories? Because it'd be tough going back then, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, it was awesome when like my pop was alive. Like said, so Dad's dad. He'd come and sit on the header and just marvel mm. <laughs> uh, on the machinery and yeah, how how it's changed over his life. Because he was ninety two when he passed away. So he like the, just a change in his mm. lifetime let alone before that was just, yeah, the stories were pretty cool. What he'd done and what he's seen and what's happened and yeah, it's pretty amazing really. I've so. got memories of that with my grandfather on the farm too, just going to do something simple, feeding the cows or something, you'd spend half an hour at a gate just talking about old stone walls or fences or yep. the way they used to do it. And yeah. in some ways we've got yeah. it easy, but there's some challenges in other areas, aren't there? Yeah, we do. Like we're very, very efficient now. But we still seem to be time poor because mm. I think it just jams so much more into your week than the old timers did. They mm. only had to, you know, what they had to do in a week was fill their week in. But compared to what we can do in a week now with our technology and bigger machinery is, yeah, and we just keep trying to jam more in, I suppose. <laughs> well, we do, we do. Yeah. So you were born in the area. Where did you go to school? Uh, so I was yeah, born in Jamestown and went to school in Jamestown. Secondary school too? Yep. Yeah, all my schooling was in Jamestown. Did you love school? Not really. No, no. I was more of a, I'd make any excuse to be out with dad <laughs> yeah. if I could. No, nah, school wasn't a, wasn't a love of mine anyway. You went on to, you took on a trade. Can you tell me about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't finish, I didn't do year 12 at school. I did year 11 only because I had to. <laughs> I got told I had to. I found myself an apprenticeship and somewhere to live and I started, I went down Adelaide, well, not quite Adelaide, but uh, Gawler. Yep. And did an apprenticeship as a boilermaker, welder, so yeah, did that and after that I went exploring the countryside. That's right, you and Holly went over to the west for a while? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, so yeah, after my apprenticeship I went to Darwin, I did a couple of years up there and then come back and me and Holly got together and we went to... Roxby, and then we went to West Australia. Right. Yeah. Let's do a spot of fishing in Darwin. Uh, yes. Yeah, not as much as I probably wanted to because I was single and earning a fair bit of coin. So we we had a fair bit of boys and we had a fair bit of fun out there. So a bit of fishing, a bit of looking around. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it was good. And in the West, you were in the mines. No, I no. wasn't. Holly was. I was running, I was contracting, just running my own business, contracting to uh, some other companies in town. There's a port port job there 
uh, they're doing a um, grain grain handling facility on the port in um, Bunbury. So I worked on that pretty much my, oh geez, it'd nearly be most of the time we were over there. A year and a half, I reckon, I was on that construction job. So so did you always know that, y that you wanted to come home to the farm? No, no, I had no idea. Really? Well, I didn't really, I, I was, I loved what I did as a boilermaker mm -hmm. and, and uh, contracting, like running my own business, being a contractor, just being able to go wherever I wanted and work off the back of my ute and all that kind of stuff. I, I really, really loved it. And farming, really, oh, I helped out a lot as a, when I was younger and helped out when I could and loved it, but never really envisaged myself back on the farm until we moved back from Western Australia. And we're kind of toying up with where we wanted to settle down and start a family and all that. And, and then the farm kind of went, light bulb moment went off, I suppose, and everything kind of, yeah, it made sense to come back on the farm and we had a shed here, it's like a little small shed there to, to work out of as well. Like, so did my engineering and farming at the same time. So. And you're still doing a bit of that now. I saw you on a, working on a big D7 over there today. Yeah, so still do a fair bit, yeah, now. So I've made the bigger workshop so I can take on more or do do bigger jobs and and that's a dream workshop that I've always wanted. So um finally got that a few years ago and yeah, still do a fair bit of engineering and and, and farming. So yeah. And does Holly keep buying your presents, does she? There was a big folding machine over there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bonus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've got that pasta there. Uh, I've got a cut. I've got both those machines, pasta, the guillotine and the press, <laughs> both in the same year. It was, I got her at a weak moment, I think. <laughs> so, when you arrived back here to Jamestown, there was a lot of sheep. Were they wool sheep? Uh, yeah, so we, when I come home, like the uh, self placing, self replacing merinos for wool, and dad had them pretty well sorted out for meat as well. So yeah, the mix, the farming mix was probably half, half, half sheep, half cropping. And now you're all cropping. Yep. Why that change? The change, I, I never got along with sheep. It, they really bring the worst out of me. Um, they can be quite dumb. Yeah, and I, it just, they were frust, they frustrated me big time. Um, and I'd, I'd see my time as, if I, I was spending time in the sheep yards doing sheep, I could have spent that time in the workshop yeah, right. doing something I actually loved yeah. rather than r hating every minute of being in the sheep yard. So that was my trait, like that was kind of my th train of the thinking behind it was like, yeah, my engineering was my sheep and they just, yeah. And I, I'd, the more dad stepped back out of the farm, the more I took over, the more we phased the sheep out. And so with all your cropping now, you've got some quite innovative practices that you're taking on. Can you yep. tell me about that? Uh, well, yeah, so uh, the way we crop, uh, so we are probably not traditional in a sense. We're disc seeder, uh, John Deere disc seeder, and we run a stripper front harvest over uh, wheat and barley. And I put the stripper front over the lentils as well. So it's yeah, so minimum zero two and as much cover as I can keep on the place. All right, so going back to the stripper front, is that what it's called? Yep. That is just taking the heads off, is it, and not the rest of the yep. stuff? Yeah, so it's a yeah, shellborn stripper front, and it's, that's literally all it's doing is just plucking the heads off and leaving the whole stalk, and it will leave some of the backbone of the the head on there too because it literally just just strips the head off or strips the grain off the head but then what about all that stubble what do you do with that leave it leave it standing so then in summer so then rest of summer that standing stubble is shading my ground uh, the wind is protecting my soil from the wind uh, any summer storms i get i'm retaining all that moisture um, and then I'll be hot on my summer spraying, so no plant will then draw on that mm. summer storm. It's like that thunderstorm that's come through. Um, and then come seeding time, I've still got these 
nice high standing straws, stubble, and the disc seeder will just go straight through it. I'll have no trouble really? with it. Really? It doesn't act as trash then? No, nah, there's no trouble with getting through it with a disc. It just cuts straight, rolls straight through it, cuts straight through it, doing, you know, seeding at 10, 11 k's an hour. God, I love just, this theory. So how deep is your disc going and what soil disturbance uh, is there? So the disc I'm using is a single disc opener. Uh, wheat and barley and lentils are at 25 mil deep. Beans, you try and get them in as deep as you can. You, know, you might get them in at 50 mil, depending on the like how hard it is come the soil is come seeding time. And it's literally you yeah, it's opening a slot 20 mil to 25 mil wide, and then it's. Putting the seed in, firming, firming will kind of is like your thumb pushing on the seed. So your seed to soil contact is pretty much 100%. And then a closing wheel shuts the trench up at the end. Are you putting a synthetic fertilizer in there or a compost pellet? I've got a mix of both. It's I've got a compost pellet I get from a company in South Australia the, from Adelaide's Green Waste. They compost it and then turn it into a pellet. So then we can use it broadacre. Uh, in with the seed in the ground. Yep. Yeah, in the same furrow. Yep. Yeah, in the ground. And I'm still, I am still using a, a synthetic fertilizer, but it's coated with different minerals and silicates, and it's kind of buffered like carbon sources. And and yeah, so then there's not as much synthetic fertilizer used because of my other more natural stuff in there too. Do you think they germinate a little bit quicker with the natural? Oh, way faster, yeah. yeah. And then I'm not using any seed, any chemical seed treatment. So the seed treatment I put on is like all natural. God, that must feel good. It does. And uh, I liquid inject as well at the same time. So I've got a liquid system on my bar as well. So I liquid inject. What are you putting in that? That's, so I think the brew we used this year was like a seaweed and um, fish extracts yeah and then what about a foliar fertilizer later on so foliar fertilizer later on they consist of like kind of similar so uh, a, a, a fish fish emulsion we use a product called pyroag which is a um like wood vinegar smoke water Jeez. Uh, yeah um as a carbon source and a kind of a adjuvant in a way i suppose so that's so it's a all natural foliar Mate, you are that close to being organic. Yeah, I still like, well, in a way, I suppose, but I still, I still will use a chemical if it's needed, because at the end of the day, the bottom line is we still got to make money. That's it. And and uh, and our system is driven by yield, mm. more yield, more money. Mm. So I, you've, I've, I still use insecticide when I need to, when like if I desperately have to. Um, I'll still use a fungicide if I desperately need to, but they both will get buffered with a fish emulsion or a wood vinegar like at the same time. So then your microbes and your bugs can break down that and your plant can metabolise that, that product faster and get over it. So what are some of your biggest challenges? Uh, biggest challenges? Rain? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But that's, but the system, like this year's kind of a bit of proof, proof in a system. We've had not a lot of growing season rain. And what I've been able to grow off of that is, is, uh, is blowing my mind what we've been able to do. Um, because of the, the compost pellets and that natural dis dis cedar, ground cover. I think it's everything. Yeah, because I'm thinking too, you, you, your soil has to be healthier before you even start being shaded, protected. Yep. We don't have wind erosion. Our paddocks aren't sweeping. We're not baking our soil. Mm. So you've got, I try to strive for 100% ground cover, but because the system's starting, the soil biology is starting to tick over, it's actually breaking, starting to break down probably faster than I'd like, mm. but it's a, that's a good thing because then it means your soils are working. Mm. I think it's everything. Like it's, it's a whole system approach mm. from the disc seed of the stripper front to then the, 
foliars to the more natural fertilizers. Mm. Like it's a whole. And it, and in a bad season too, would you be likely to have a bit more moisture in the soil because it's been shaded and looked after a bit more or not? Uh, definitely. Like so. So for this year, for instance, we've had well it's the lowest rainfall on record so far. The year's not done yet, and we'll probably yeah. get a thunderstorm and it'll wreck our record. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, you're in a nervous time of the year too, aren't you? A couple uh, of weeks out from heading. Yes, yeah, we're two or three weeks away from actually being able to get into it. But so November, December, and the first week of January, we had uh, 150 mil of rain. Golly. Which was nearly more than our previous year's growing season rain we had in summer. For this year, <clears throat> we've had 195. Five, I think I just looked at for the year, and 45 of that was in January. Wow. So about 150 mil growing season rain, and the crops look amazing, really, for mm. what we've had. Mm. I just can't fathom how they're doing it. Mm. So, yeah. Well done to you. What's the most popular app you look at? Would it be the weather forecast app? It was there for a while. I think I was looking at that that much. It was not raining. <laughs> and so I stopped looking at it and then it started raining. But um, yeah, that would be the probably there for a while because it, it was a bit panicky there for a bit. So you're two weeks out from heading. You've got all the gear ready. You'd be getting a little bit anxious. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited to get into it. I'm, I'm like a kid at Christmas. It's um, wake up early in the morning. I can't get back to sleep. And <laughs> but... Uh, Go away for the weekend and relax with the kids and the family and hopefully get into um, some of my uh, business partners. Hopefully you've got some beans next week to start reaping. So, Yeah. Talking about your crops here, you've got wheat, barley, some other legumes too. Yeah, beans and lentils. And what's the advantage of having them into the mix? So our legumes are our nitrogen fixes. So as they're growing, their roots are nodulating, putting natural like natural nitrogen back into the soil i use beans because i've got a, just a, an amazing root system mm. so what you see what you see out of the ground they're doing the same roots in the ground yeah and plus fixing nitrogen they're just i quite like what beans do for your soil probably not the best gross margin crop here yeah but bit of a trade-off I suppose. Well that's right well then would you go and put wheat or barley in there the following and, year? And then all, and then you follow up with the wheat. Yeah. You don't have to put that much nitrogen on your wheat because it's drawing from your legume. Yeah. And then barley that stuff just grows you feed a little bit of in and you kind mm. of shut the gate and <laughs> forget about that like it is. I use barley in the rotation because of the straw. Yeah. The amount of ground cover and the straw load you get off of barley is just phenomenal. Like if you just grew, if you say you did wheat, wheat, and then a bean, like legume, the wheat stubble's really harsh and sticky and not much of it compared to barley. Whereas barley, if you can get that to tiller mm. and grow nice and high, like the thatch of stubble you'll have on the ground afterwards is just second to none it's it's a no, it's a real good ground cover mm. locking in moisture and yeah it's that's why i grow barley it's easy to grow so is there less input costs and better yields yeah so i can't say i'll out yield the neighbor on a good year and he'll be cropping like just the the conventional yeah. way of yeah. cropping and like f the full chemical regime i, I won't out yield them by any stretch, but I'm up there with them. Yeah. But then on a year like this, about 150 mil of rain, and I'll guarantee you I'll out yield them by a long shot. Mm, well done. So I'm, I'm still capitalising on the good years, but I'm, I've still got my head above the water on the bad years. Yeah. And like the input costs are, are a lot less. Mm. Like your, your cost of fertiliser and chemical per tonne of grain grown is a lot less mm. than conventional way of farming. So. And it must feel good too, being uh, having less chemicals out there. Yes, it does, yeah. No, it definitely does. So tell me, you're in a joint venture with somebody with machinery? Yeah, so this is, we've gone into a partnership. We, this is the first year we've set up, we've just set up all our machinery for it. This is our first harvest. 
So contract cropping, contract harvesting? So, well, so what happened was we got through last harvest and me and a mate from the other side of town were talking about the harvest and how they went and their frustrations and whatever else of the year and he kind of said, oh, would you want to buy a header together? <laughs> we both had headers anyway. And I was like, well, we both just were complaining about labour and, you know, it'd be nice to have more help and uh, and machinery. We were just whinging about machinery costs and all the rest mm. of the stuff. And we're like, well, come on, let's have a go. Like, so we started a partnership together. Uh, Henry had a, a header and a chase bin and his header is... Uh, newer and the next class up than what I run. So we've stuck with his mm -hmm. header and chaser bin and we went and bought a second-hand truck and second-hand trailers to set up a road train. Really? Three trailers? Two, just two. So then in the winter season we can both have a trailer each and then we've kept my little prime mover so then we mm -hmm. can have a truck and trailer each come seeding time, winter and we'll seed uh, and do separate seedings. But then harvest time, we can bring both trailers, truck, header, chaser bin all together and pull our labour as well. Mm. So now we've got, you know, instead of two of us, me in the truck and dad in the header, we've got, it'll be me in the truck this year, Henry in the header, and then between my dad and his dad and Holly and mm. like Henry's wife, we've got labour for... Labour for days. So. Well done. And will you go and do some contract work elsewhere? We have talked about it. <clears throat> this year hasn't been the year to um, to do it because our area is like there's – you only have to go, f you know, 5Ks to 10Ks west and there's blokes that will put the header in the paddock and just get their seed back and then won't reap other paddocks. So it's – yeah, but we will. Like it'd be nice. That is the plan to earn a bit more money with the machinery by contracting in an earlier area and then flow into our own harvest. So. so this is Henry we're talking about. Yep. And I believe you two are a couple of YouTube stars, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> well, it's Henry's channel, Lock, Lock Valley Farms. Uh, I've been watching a bit of Lock Valley Farms no, and that's yeah, great. Yeah, he's buddy. He does a good job. He does a very good job. And through the partnership and, and uh, his YouTube, I have been... Uh, on there now <laughs> he's got me he got me all right so if our listeners want to jump on some uh, good info in cropping farming in uh, south australia they can log on to lock valley farming yeah all right luke this is the fun part we've got some off the wall questions here and first up what do people misunderstand about you most <laughs> uh they probably misunderstand about me the most would be I don't know, I can probably come across fairly harsh and abrupt if you first meet me. People think probably I'm, I don't know, not stuck up, but it's pretty harsh to get along with until they actually get to know me. So yeah, that's probably what they misunderstand the most. What was your biggest failure and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, geez. I've probably had a, a lot of, not a lot of failures, but I'd probably class them as learning curves. Mm. over my lifetime, well, it was a probably short lifetime compared to some, but uh, I'll make mistakes quite on a regular basis, but I learn from them and Absolutely. don't make them again. Yeah. I can't think of any big, massive ones that I still regret to today. Like, yeah, good. There's none of those ones. So, Well said, mate. If you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Oh, jeez. Um, Good husband, <laughs> good father, De definitely good cook. Top, top of the list. <laughs> I don't know, like just, yeah, remembered for how we farm and what I can achieve in the workshop and, yeah, family life, I suppose, as well, work-life balance. Nice, mate. If your farm had a theme song, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have no idea. <laughs> oh, I have no idea what that would be. What about Alan Jackson, it's five o'clock somewhere? <laughs> yeah, well, that'd probably be all right, yeah. <laughs> What's your favourite dad joke related to farming? My kids shake my, their head at me a lot mm. for, the just, best ones. for just shocking dad jokes, but I can never remember, remember <laughs> them after the fact. What's one thing you wish you could teach your crops if they could actually listen? <laughs> um, not to grow so bloody high because... <laughs> 
the rain can shut off. Yeah. <laughs> so to conserve some of that moisture for actually growing grain and to um, prepare themselves for a frost better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get hit so hard on frost. Yeah, that's a bit slack of them, isn't it? Yeah. That's what I'd try and teach them a bit. And if you could give your 18-year-old self some advice, what would you say? <laughs> Jeez, I had a blast when I was 18. <laughs> and I don't reckon I'd tell him to do anything different. Yeah. I could tell him to, you know, pull your head in and buy a house and invest your money and do all this stuff, but then it wouldn't have been as fun. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Is there one, two or three influential people in your life? I've had a lot over the years. Where I've been with work and, and what I've done and the, the friends I've made, like in Northern Territory and Roxby, and there's probably a person out of each, each realm, really. But mm. like one, I don't know, one big one, I suppose, is Pop. Nice. Is there something in your career that you didn't expect? Go on farm. <laughs> yeah. And what time of the day do you get your best work done? Early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, earlier the better. What does your favourite Saturday involve? That's a tough one because I do thoroughly enjoy spending time with the kids, mm. like away in the caravan or in the, like just at the beach. But then I also do thoroughly enjoy just tinkering on my own stuff in a workshop. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a tough one. All right, mate, if you could sit down and have a cold beer with somebody, who would it be? I don't know who it would be, to be honest. Or well, does your pop have a beer? Did he have a beer? Yeah, I did. Every now and again, yeah. Yeah, no, he probably would be one, yeah, for sure. And if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? I'm quite happy here. Yeah, or at the beach somewhere. But then... Beach for know, a holiday, mate. Beach for a holiday. It'd ruin it. It'd ruin it if you'd live there all the time, I reckon. But no, I'm quite happy where I am. Well, Luke, it's been fascinating talking to you, mate, and congratulations on this transition. I think it's an absolute cracker. Mm. And you're a champion, mate. Thanks so much for your time. No worries. Too easy. I love that concept. And the story behind it just keeps getting better. That afternoon, I had the privilege of sitting down with Luke's dad, Trevor. In this episode, we dive into Trevor's journey of lifelong learning and his deep passion for addressing the issue of unhealthy food production, all while prioritising quality over quantity. It's a truly inspiring conversation, published in the coming weeks. In the meantime... Please follow us on Facebook. Salt of the Earth Farm Stories is proudly brought to you by Grig Media.